So in this video we're going to discuss the piano arithmetic, which means the arithmetic of the natural numbers. It's another name for the arithmetic of the natural numbers, named after a famous mathematician called Piano, who was the first to rigorously characterise the axioms that the natural numbers obey. So this video is going to be in the playlist on set theory, and it it is intended to follow the video on the natural numbers, and really you do need to have watched that video before watching this video. In that video, we construct the natural numbers as a set using the von Neumann construction. We then put an ordering on the natural numbers, and we then define the addition and multiplication laws on the natural numbers. We also finally end that video by discussing the axiom of induction, uh, which is the logical axiom that allows proof by induction as a uh, accepted mathematical argument. So the purpose of this video is now to study the addition and multiplication laws that we defined on the natural numbers in the previous video in more detail. In particular, what I want to do is prove that addition obeys associativity and commutativity, and I want to prove that multiplication obeys distributivity associativity and commutativity. So I want to prove the key axioms that means that the natural numbers as a set with the addition and multiplication laws on top of it uh, obeys the axioms or the definition of a semi-ring. So that's the aim for this video and please do have watched the previous video on the natural numbers because all of these proofs are going to be using proof by induction so it's a crucial axiom that we went through at the end of the previous video. So let's begin with addition then, and let's start by just recalling content from the previous video. Let's go over how we defined the addition law on the natural numbers. So let's draw out a composition table here. So this is going to be the addition composition table. So we're going to have all the natural numbers up here. Obviously I'm not going to draw them all, so there's the first five. And then they're all also going to be in this part of the table as well. And then we need to define what all the entries in this composition table are going to be. So firstly, because we want an identity element, we, we know and we know what we're heading for, we set zero to be the identity element. We know, after all, the familiar law of the natural number addition that we're trying to reach where zero is going to be the additive identity. We're not trying to create something new here. So uh, we make zero the additive identity. So that tells us what this entire row here is going to be because zero added to any of these is just going to give that other number back again. So zero plus a is going to equal a. So we can now fill in these. So zero plus zero is zero. 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 2 is 2, 0 plus 3 is 3, 0 plus 4 is 4. We also want this column to be very simply defined as well because the additive identity composed either way has to act as an identity element. So we also know that anything a plus 0 has to give a back again as well. So that allows us to fill in this column. So 1 plus 0 is going to be 1, 2 plus 0 is going to be 2, 3 plus 0 is going to be 3, and 4 plus 0 is going to be 4. Now, how then did we define the rest of the elements in this composition table? Well, remember, we did it through a recursive definition. So it worked row-wise. So if you wanted to know what the entry here was, all you needed to look at is what the entry to the left of it in this row was equal to, and take the successor of that, so the next number along in the natural numbers, and then to work out this one, you just had to look at the successor of this one here. So we could write down a rule for that, which was that if you wanted to know what a general element A, so this is the general element in the column here, plus the successor of B is equal to, so B would be our element up here, and then the successor of B would be the one along. So we're saying A plus the successor of B. So in this case, A is 1, and the successor of B is going to be 2, so B is going to be equal to 1 as well. So if we want to know what that is equal to, it's just the successor of A plus B. So it's equal to the successor of A plus B. So again, just going over what that means. So in this case, A is equal to 1, 
b in this case is equal to 0, the successor of b is going to be equal to 1, so we're looking at 1 plus 1, and the way we would do that is look at what a plus b is equal to, so 1 plus 0, which is this answer, and then just take the successor of that, so the answer here is going to be 2, and then the answer here is going to be the successor of this one, so 3, and so on, 4, 5. And this is going to work for every single row because we have defined the first entry in each row. So here was the first entry defined in this row, here's the first entry defined in this row, and here's the first entry defined in this row. So because we've got this here, this tells us what the first entry is equal to, and then you can get all the other entries through this relation by just taking the successor of that one, and then for the next one you take the successor of that one, etc. So you can build what the entire row is going to be equal to, and hence you can build the entire composition table. So there's a recap of the addition composition law on the natural numbers. Now what we want to do is prove that this composition table that we end up with is going to obey associativity and commutativity, i.e. that it's going to be a commutative monoid. Um, so, of course, we know that it obeys these properties. We can see that the composition table we get is going to be the familiar natural number composition table, which we've used since we were in primary school, and we know that that obeys these properties. But now what we want to do is actually rigorously prove that, because you probably didn't rigorously prove that when you learned it as a 10-year-old. So, we will begin with associativity. So, what we want to prove, I'm going to write this out with quite formal notation. So, we want to really prove for all A, B, and C are natural numbers. And really, if we were going even more rigorous, we'd have put three for alls here. We'd have put for all A as an element of the natural numbers, and for all B as an element of the natural numbers, and for all C as an element of the natural numbers. But it really gets a bit labor intensive if we start doing that. But that's really what this means. It's free for alls there, free universal logical quantifiers. So. For all a, b, and c are elements of the natural numbers, what we want to prove is that a plus b plus c is equal to a plus, and then the brackets around, b plus c. And of course, this isn't trivial that this is true. You know, if you take three elements in this uh, number system and firstly add these two together, you'll get some answer in the number system, and then you take that answer and add it to c, you'll get one thing, that'll be some answer somewhere in this composition table. And then if you instead take B and C and add them together, get their answer, and then take A plus that, you'll have a totally different entry in this composition table. So, you know, the entry you'll end up at by doing this, and the entry you'll end up at by doing this, are different entries in this composition table. And what this law is saying is that they have the same value. The en those two entries have the same number in their position. Uh, for all A, B, and C, so it's quite a massive property, you know, it's a, it's a big ask that it's going to obey this. Uh, it's not trivial that if you, you know, if you just made this composition table up, it would categorically not obey this unless you knew what you were doing. So this is quite an incredible law. So how are we going to prove this? Well, we're going to use proof by induction, uh, but firstly we're just going to use a bit of uh, predicate logic. So we're going to use universal introduction for the first A and B, and then we're finally going to use proof by induction just on C, rather than having to induct on A, B, and C. So let me show you what I mean. So really to prove this, what we're using is for all introduction, and I apologize for the predicate logic for those of you who don't like this. This is, remember, all just formalization of common sense of what for all means. It's the rigorous definition or the rigorous axiomatization of what this logical quantifier means. So we're using for all introduction, which I'll abbreviate to for all I, for, for all introduction, or universal introduction if you really want to be snazzy. So by for all introduction, it suffices if we want to prove this to assume that A and B are natural numbers and we'll only do it in full rigor like this once. The other times when we do this, because we're going to do proof by induction a lot in this video, the other times when we do it, we'll just, uh, we won't write these steps down, we'll just say them. But the first time, let's write it all down. So we will assume A and B are natural numbers, and now it suffices to prove that 
if a and b are natural numbers that you have for all um, whoops, let me get rid of that. For all C is an element of the natural numbers, that this holds true. A plus B plus C is equal to A plus, and then brackets, B plus C. So if given any A, B are elements of the natural numbers, you can prove that this holds true, that for all C is an element of the natural numbers, this is true. So you can prove this thing, then you can have this thing, you can have the whole thing. And really we're using repeat for all introduction, we're using for all introduction on A, and we're using for all introduction on B. We will then use the induction axiom to prove this. So just a reminder of what the induction axiom says. So it says that if you want to prove something of this form, so for all x is an element of the natural numbers, you have some predicate of x, then the way you can do that is by firstly proving that the predicate holds true for 0. So have, if you have p of 0, and if you have that for all x is an element of the natural numbers, p of x being true implies p of x plus 1 is true. So if you have p of x, you get p of x plus 1. If you have both of those things, then the axiom of induction says that you have this. And this, again, is a common sense axiom, you know, because if you have p of 0, then by this one, by universal elimination on this, you can plug in x is equal to 0 here. So you'd have p of 0 implies p of, and if we're being super rigorous here, I'd have written the successor of x rather than x plus 1. In fact, one of the things that we'll do in this video is actually prove that the successor of x is always equal to x plus 1. So if I was being super rigorous, I'd have put su uh, successor of x because we haven't quite proven that the successor of x is equal to x plus 1 yet. Um, but you'd have had the successor of 0, which is 1, so you'd have had p of 1. And then if you've got p of 1, then again you can do universal elimination on this, and p of 1 gives you p of the successor of 1, which is p of 2. And then again, p of 2 gives you p of 3, p of 3 gives you p of 4, p of 4 gives you p of 5, etc. So this is the common sense induction that we've... You've probably done at um, you know school level maths, advanced school level maths, um, but it has to be axiomatized as an axiom of logic because of that. You know, if you want, if you want to say that for all x is an element of the natural numbers, p of x is always true, then you by for all introduction to get this, you have to say, given any x is an element of the natural numbers, you have to then derive p of x. And you can say, but surely we'd be able to do that if we had p of 0 and we had this, because we just need to do this however many times to get up to your p of x. But that's the crucial step there, that however many times. How do you know that you can you know, do that transitivity of implication however many times is necessary? How do you know that? Uh, and you might just say, it's obvious that you can do that. It's common sense that you can do that. But when you end up with that as an answer for your logical reasoning, you know, that it's just common sense. That's the point that you've re reached some sort of logical axiom at that point. And uh, we've given that logical axiom a name. It's called the axiom of induction. And the other logical axioms of classical logic don't allow you to say that I will be able to do this however many times it's needed. So there is necessity for a further uh, axiom in order to make proof by induction a rational argument within classical logic. So we want to derive this thing then by using the axiom of induction. So this is equivalent to this. So we've just replaced x here with c, and this then is our predicate in c. So we're going to get this by having this and having the equivalent of this. Let's think about what that is. So firstly, we need p of 0. So we need this where you've inputted instead of c, 0. So let's think about why that's true. So we want that, remember a and b are now just general natural numbers, so they're not part of this statement in for all c. They're just general natural numbers. So a plus b plus now 0, we need that to equal a plus b plus 0. So let's think about why this is true. Well, thankfully, we know why this is true. 
So we know how to add zero to anything. We know that b plus zero is just going to be b again. So this is just going to be on the right hand side a plus b. And then on this side, again, we've got a plus b and then added to zero. But again, this is the additive identity. So when you add zero to this, it just gives it back again. So you just get a plus b. So yes, this statement is true when c is equal to zero. So we have this part of the axiom of induction. What we now need to show is the less trivial part. Uh, and we call this often when we're doing proof by inductions, we call it the base case. No, what we now need to prove is the actual inductive part. Uh, this bit. So we need to assume, uh, we need to get this. Uh, so by implication introduction, we need to assume that it's true, this bit's true, and then derive that it's true for this, that this bit, that we have this. So what we want to prove then is we need that just now replacing the x with a c and this p of x with our actual predicate here, we need that for all c is an element of the natural numbers, we need to prove that this predicate being true for c implies that it will be true for the successor of c. And remember, I'm going to actually replace that with the successor of c because, as I say, we haven't actually proven yet that the successor of c is equal to c plus 1. So we want to prove that a plus b plus c equaling a plus b plus c would then imply, would give us, that a plus b plus the successor of c is equal to a plus b plus the successor of c. So to prove this, then, we will use universal introduction. I'll just move this down. So we're going to, again, use for all introduction, a rule of inference. So for all introduction says that if you want to prove something of this form, you have to assume this part. So assume C is an element of the natural numbers and derive this. So assume C is an element of the natural numbers and derive all of this thing. I'm not going to write all of that out again, but we want to derive this. And how are we going to derive that? Well, this is an implication statement, so more logic here. To get an implication statement, we need to use implication introduction. Implication introduction, so I've just written that like that, this is implication and that's an introduction. To get this, we have to assume this and then derive this. So we assume the antecedent and derive the consequent. So we assume a plus b plus c is equal to a plus b plus c. And what we want to prove from that, prove a plus b plus the successor of c is equal to a plus b plus the successor of c. And I apologize if I'm boring some of you. So this is proof by induction. You've seen proof by induction, I'm sure, if you've got to this level of maths, you've seen proof by induction before. But you might not have ever seen it in this sort of rigor before, where we're actually breaking it down into the foundations of logic. We're only going to do this once in this video. We'll do this one like this. When we do it for all the other ones, we'll skip this. We'll just say, you know, we prove it in the base case, we then assume this, and we derive this bit. Uh, but for this first one, I do actually want to do it in full logical form. But I apologise if this is boring you or frustrating you. Um, if you're struggling with what we're doing, you know, in these steps, um, this is the foundations of logic. These are the rules of inference of classical logic that we're using here. Um, they are the common sense rules of logic. That's what classical logic is fundamentally, common sense logic. But it does need, it, it's fascinating. Logic is a fascinating subject because truly what you do is you axiomatize, you look at the foundational rules of reasoning, the rules of thought that we are all using all the time when we do mathematics, but we're usually just taking for granted. So because we've gone so foundational in our study of the natural numbers, I do think that it's appropriate to actually break what we're doing down into the foundations of logic so that you can 
see how uh, this how foundational this is. And I do think it's quite an interesting thing to do at least once in a way. So uh, let's continue on. So we want to derive this then. So the way we're going to do this is remembering how addition is defined because fundamentally the reason that associativity is going to be true is because of the way addition is defined. So we need to use uh, our definition of addition. So re remember that, and I've actually changed the symbols because if I use A and B again, it's going to be very confusing. So we'll use X and Y instead. So remember that if you want to take X and you want to add it to the successor of Y, that is equal to the successor of X plus Y. And remember the picture of what we're doing here. So if we've got our little composition table here, this is x, this is y, and then you're asking what is x plus the successor of y, so the thing along, what well, is just equal to that thing to the left of it, which is x plus y, this bit of the composition table, and then it's the successor of that. That's all that rule is saying. So we can now apply this to this bit here. So a plus b plus the successor of c, by this definition, this is x, c is y, so this is just the successor of a plus b plus c. So this bit becomes the successor of a plus b plus c. And what we can now do is apply associativity to this bit because we have this bit. We're assuming this is true. So we can, instead of this thing, we can replace it with this thing. So we can write this now as the successor of a plus b plus c. And now we can use this rule again, but in reverse. So what we can now view this as is this bit is x, this bit is y. So this a is going to be here, and this thing is going to be inside of here. So this is equal to a plus the successor of b plus c. And then we can use this again, so we can now apply this definition of addition to this thing. So B is now going to take the place of X and C is going to take the place of Y. So this is going to become, is equal to A plus, it will then be B plus the successor of C. And oh look, isn't that beautiful? That's exactly what we wanted to arrive at. So we've taken this and just using the definition of addition, we've broken it down into the thing that we want. Of course, we also use the fact that we had this. So if associativity is true for C, what we have proven is associativity will then be true for the successor of C. So by implication introduction, we now have this thing. And because we made the assumption that C was any element of the natural numbers, this argument holds for all of them. So by for all introduction, we now have this statement here. And then, because we have it true in the base case, so we have it true for zero, and we have this, then by the axiom of induction, we now have it in this form, which is this. So indeed, we have proven that this is true. So for all C as an element of the natural numbers, A plus B plus C is equal to A plus B plus C. And then going right back to this bit up here, but we were assuming A and B were general elements of the natural numbers. So by repeat for all introduction on A and B, we then finally have this thing up here that for all A, B and C are elements of the natural numbers, this law holds true. So we have now proven that our addition law is going to obey associativity. Next, we'll move on to commutativity, which is slightly more difficult, but we're not going to go through the full logical rigor this time, so it'll take us less time. So let's move on to commutativity now. So we'll just go over here. So commutativity of addition then. So we want to prove that for all A and B are elements of the natural numbers, that A plus B, and we don't actually even need those brackets, they're just confusing things, A plus B is equal to B plus A. So again, we're going to do this by induction. So we're going to um, use universal introduction on A, and we'll keep B. So by universal introduction, 
it suffices to assume that A is a general element of the natural numbers and then prove that for all B is an element of the natural numbers, A plus B is equal to B plus A. And then the way we're going to prove that statement is then by induction. So we're going to prove that it's true for B is equal to zero, and then we're going to assume it's true for a general B and prove that it's then true for the successor of B. And then by the induction axiom, we'll have that for all B is an element of the natural numbers, A plus B is equal to B plus A. And then by for all introduction on A, we'll have it that it's true for all A and B are elements of the natural numbers. So I'm not going to write all of that out as I did in the previous case. So what we first thing we need to do then is that base case. So we're assuming A is a general element of the natural numbers and we're working with B now and we want to prove that it's true when B is equal to zero. So let's show why that's true. So when B is equal to zero, A plus zero is equal to zero plus A. Well, of course that's true because we know that whenever you add zero to anything either way around, uh, it just gives that thing back again. So this side is A and this side is A. So it's true in the base case. So now what we want to do is assume it's true for a general B and prove that it's true for the successor of B. So that we have that A plus B is equal to B plus A. And what we want to prove is that A plus the successor of B is equal to the successor of B plus A. So we need to start from this side and derive this side. So again, we're going to use the definition of addition, which I'll write down here. So x plus the successor of y is equal to the successor of x plus y. And you can see how we're going to use this on the left-hand side here. So we're going to let b equal y and x equal a. So this becomes the successor, therefore, of a plus b. And this is looking so easy, but it's going to, it's going to get more difficult. Um, so now we're just going to apply commutativity of these two, which we had as our assumption. So this will become the successor of b plus a. And it's very tempting to say, oh, this is equal to this. Wonderful. But that's not what you can do. Applying this rule, you can use b is equal to x and a is equal to y. And you can therefore write this, if you like, as b plus the successor of a. But that's not what we were aiming for. Oh dear, how are we going to do this? So what we actually need to do is prove a separate little theorem here, which is that the successor of B plus A is equal to the successor of B plus A, which we don't yet have. And we'll actually do a whole little separate proof by induction to prove this. And then if we had that, then we can replace this here with this, which is what we want, instead of this. This is what our definition at the moment allows us to do, but that's not what we want. We want this. Uh, so we need to prove that, and we'll do that by a separate proof by induction now. So let's prove this then. So we'll just go down here. So we want to prove that for all A and B are elements of the natural numbers, we want to prove that that statement holds true. Now, Again, we're going to use our same trick. We're going to assume either A or B is a general element of the natural numbers and then prove for all whichever one is left that this statement holds true. And we'll do that by using the axiom of induction. Now, there's a big question here. Which one are we going to pick to assume? Are we going to pick B to assume or are we going to pick A to assume? Well, you could pick either. Universal introduction doesn't hold you back. It says you can pick either. But if you were to pick B, the job you would end up, sorry, if you were to pick A rather as the one that you're just going to assume and then try and prove it inductively on B, you will end up with a much more difficult job than if you assume B and try and prove A. And the reason is that you've already got this successor of B involved in here. So if you try and induct on B, you're going to end up with them with the successor of the successor of B. Whereas if you pick A, it's beautiful. You know, you're just going to end up with a successor of A here and a successor of A here. So that's why we're going to assume B is a general element of the natural numbers, and then we'll prove that for all A is an element of the natural numbers, this holds true, and we'll do that by induction. So I'll write some of that down. So assume B is a general element of the natural numbers, and we want to prove for all A is an element of the natural numbers that S of B plus A is equal to the successor of b plus a. 
And we're going to prove, ooh, gosh, what did it do there? Sorry about that. And we want to prove uh, this by induction. So we'll prove it, therefore, for the base case where a is equal to zero, and then we'll assume it's true for the general a and prove that it's then true for the successor of a. So firstly, let's check zero. So the successor of b plus zero is equal to the successor of b plus zero. Well, again, very simple. b plus zero is just b. A successor of b plus zero is just the successor of b. So you've just got the successor of b is equal to the successor of b. So that's clearly true. Next, we will assume it's true for the general a. So we have now that the successor of b plus a is equal to the successor of b plus a. And clearly I'm not writing this down in full formality, but I'm saying what I'm doing to you, so I hope you're following it. And if you're going to write the proof by induction in full rigour, you would need to put a few more words in to say what you're actually doing. So we're going to assume that that's true. And then what we want to prove is that it's then true for the successor of a. So we want to prove the successor of b plus the successor of a is equal to the successor of b plus the successor of a. And if we can prove that, then by the induction axiom, we'll have uh, this thing here. And then by universal introduction, we'll have the full thing that we wanted to prove. So how are we going to do this? Again, we're just going to use the definition of addition. So I'll just write that down again, because everything that we're doing comes from the definitions, remember. So x plus the successor of y is equal to the successor of x plus y. So in this case, we're going to let x equal the successor of b, and we're going to let y equal a. So that will turn this thing into the successor of the successor of b. So I'm just filling in x is equal to this, so that successor of b is coming in there, plus now y is equal to a, so this is the successor of b plus a. So this thing on this side has become this. And now what I can just do is use what our assumption, so we know it's true for a, we've assumed it's true for a, and we're trying to prove it's true for the successor of a, so we've got this bit, so we can fill in this into here. So that will then make this the successor, the successor of b plus a. And now that looks very hopeful as something we're going to be able to break down into this thing here using our rule here. So we've got this can be fit in for this. So b can now equal x and a can equal y. And therefore, we can write this as b plus the successor of a. So this is going to be the successor of b plus the successor of a which is exactly what we were aiming to prove. So we've turned this thing into this thing using the definition of addition and using the inductive assumption. So we've proven the induction step, and therefore by the axiom of induction, as we have that it's true for the base case, and we have that the inductive uh, statement is true, uh, then we have this, that for all a is an element of the natural numbers, this is true. And then because we're assuming b is a general natural number, then by universal introduction on b, we have that for all a and b is an element of the natural numbers, that this is true. Now, with this little theorem that we've proven, it is helpful to think about what this actually means, because this has a very intuitive meaning. So draw a composition table. So the whole definition of addition was done using the rows. So we defined the next element along as the successor of the one to the left of it. What's incredible is that the same property is going to hold true in the columns, even though it wasn't defined like that. The, this definition of getting the next element in the row by taking the successor of the current one this actually gives rise to the same pattern in the columns, and that's what we've just proven here. So let's think about this. So if we think about what the successor of b plus a is equal to the successor of b plus a means, so here is b. In fact, I'll get rid of that dot. That's just in the way. So here is b. Here is the successor of b, and then we're adding them to a. So b plus a is this entry here. And then the successor of b plus a is this entry below it. And what this 
this is saying is that this entry here underneath this one is just going to be the successor of that one. So to get the next element down, you can just take the successor of the one above it. So in this big composition table, if we wanted this element, even though the definition says you take the successor of this one, actually that definition gives rise to this being true and it, you could actually just take the successor of the one in, above it. So you can see that this holds true with the pattern that we've already got here. In fact, if we fill in some more entries on here, we know this is going to be 3, 4, 5, 6, 4, 5, 6, 7, 5, 6, 7, 8. And you can see the incredible property, uh, sorry, the incredible patterns in the addition composition table of the natural numbers. And you can see that if you take any element, this element here, it's the successor of the one to the left of it, which is how we defined it, but also it ends up being the successor of the one above it as well. And that you can see is true for every single one. And that's what we've just proven abstractly here, that having this composition table defined in terms of successors of the horizontal rows gives rise to it also uh, having the successor structure in the columns as well. So that's quite beautiful. So now we can go back to proving commutativity. So here we were, let's just remind ourselves where we were. So we wanted to prove for all A and B are elements of the natural numbers that this holds true. So we assumed A is an element of the natural numbers and then we wanted to prove that for all B is an element of the natural numbers that this holds true. And we'll do that by the induction axiom. So we'll prove that it's true for B is equal to zero, which we did. And we then assume it's true for the general B and derive that it's true for the successor of B and then by the induction axiom, we can have that it's true for all B, and then by universal introduction, we'll have that it's true for all A and B. So we were trying to prove this inductive bit. So we wanted to prove that A plus the successor of B is equal to the successor of B plus A. We rewrote this as the successor of A plus B, just using the definition of addition. And by the commutativity of B with A, we rewrote this as the successor of B plus A, and we want to get that this is equal to this, but before, all we could do was rewrite this as B plus the successor of A, but now, using this theorem that we've just proven, the successor of B plus A is going to equal the successor of B plus A, so we can say this truly can be rewritten as this, and therefore we've done exactly what we wanted to do, we've proven the inductive step, we've proven that if it's true for A, sorry, if it's true for B, it's going to be true for the successor of B, and therefore we have that it's true for all B, uh, and then by universal introduction we have that it's true for all A and B. So we've now proven commutativity of addition of the natural numbers. Before we move on to multiplication and proving that that obeys distributivity, associativity, and commutativity, um, I would just like to prove one more thing about addition, and that is that 1 plus any natural number A is equal to the successor of that natural number A. Uh, and then by commutativity that we've just proven, if we prove that, then we'll also have that A plus 1 is also the successor of A. So let's just prove this one, as we'll get that second one by commutativity. So we'll do this by a proof by induction on A. So we want to prove that for all A is an element of the natural numbers, 1 plus A is equal to the successor of A. That's our predicate. So we'll do this by the axiom of induction. So if we prove that it's true for A is equal to 0, and then we prove that the inductive step is true as well, then we'll have this. So for A is equal to 0 then, so 1 plus 0 uh, is obviously equal to 1, which is indeed the successor of 0. So it's true for A is equal to 0. And now what we want to do is prove that it, uh, sorry, assume it's true for the general A, and then prove that it's true then for the successor of A. So we want to prove 1 plus the successor of A is equal to the successor of the successor of A. Well, here what we can do is just use the definition of addition, so we've got 1 plus the successor of something, so that's just going to be the successor of 1 plus a, so again I'll just remind you of the definition of addition, so x plus the successor of y is equal to the successor of x plus y, so in here what we're doing is filling in 1 for x and we're, we're filling in y as a, so 
x is here and y is equal to a is here. And then what we do is we use our assumption here that it was true for a to replace 1 plus a with the successor of a. And this is therefore the successor of the successor of a, which is what we wanted to prove. So we've proven that if it's true for a, it's true for the successor of a. Um, and that worked for the general a, so we have for all a is an element of the natural numbers, that it being true for a implies it's true for the successor of a. And therefore, by induction, uh, we have that it's true for all a. So that proves that, that 1 plus a is always going to be equal to the successor of a. And by commutativity, then, a plus 1 is also always going to equal the successor of a. So let's continue now with multiplication. So like we did with addition, we'll begin by reminding ourselves of how multiplication was defined. So we'll draw a multiplication composition table here. And we'll just put in the first five natural numbers as we did with addition. But of course, the table goes on. So when we begin with defining multiplication, we begin with the simple cases. So the first ones, the first answers that we put into this composition table are what all the answers for this row is going to equal and what all the answers for this column is going to equal. So we're looking at the answers to what is 0 times a general natural number a, and the answer is going to be 0. And similarly, for a times uh, 0, again, the answer is going to be 0. So what? this one here tells us is that all the entries of this row here, when you take 0 and multiply it by a general natural number a, you're going to get 0 back again each time. So all of these are going to be equal to 0. And this one here, this tells us that if you take a general natural number a and you multiply it by 0, all of these entries are going to be 0. So all of this column here, these are all going to be 0. Now, we can instantly know that this has to be the case. And the reason we know that the additive identity multiplied by anything both ways round has to give back the additive identity is because we want multiplication to distribute over addition. We want distributivity to hold true in our algebraic structure that we're defining. And the moment you insist on distributivity, you can, you can, you, it then has to be the case that this is true. You can derive from distributivity that this has to be true. So let's just see how that is the case. So remember there are two distributive laws. There's a, it's the two ways round. There's right distributivity and left distributivity. Now I do not know, neither do I particularly care that I do not know which one is which. Um, so this is one of them here. So a plus b times c, I would imagine this is right distributivity because multiplication distributes over addition. So because the multiplication in this case is on the right-hand side, I would imagine that this is called right distributivity, but I could be wrong. It doesn't matter, though, what the name for it is. What matters is the understanding that there are two, the two ways around. So uh, this distributive law says that a plus b times c is the same as a times c plus b times c, like so. Now, why does this give rise to the fact that um, one of these has to be true and the other one will come from distributivity the other way around? Um, so if we put in b is equal to 0 into this, so if we put a plus 0 times c, well, of course, a plus 0 is just equal to a. So this is a times c. But if we apply distributivity to this, we get that this is a times c plus 0 times c. So we now have that a times c plus whatever this thing is equal to has to give back a times c. And from that, we can infer that this thing has to be equal to the additive identity, i.e. that 0 times any natural number has to give 0. Now, how can we conclude that this has to be the additive identity from that? Well, it's because the way addition is defined, we know that if you add, add something to something else and you get back that thing. So if you have, if I write this down, because otherwise it sounds absurd, if you have A and you add B to it and you get back A, you can instantly conclude that this has to be the additive identity. And the reason for that is the way that it's defined. So if we 
draw out the composition table of addition to help us with this. So if this is the composition table of addition, if we have a here, we know that a plus 0 is equal to a, and then if you think about where b is equal to, it's something out here, if, we, if it was a general b, if, if we suppose the opposite, so we're sort of doing a little informal proof by contradiction here, so if we suppose that b isn't equal to 0, then it would be out here in the composition table, so a plus b would be over here, and then if you just remember how addition is defined, it's the successor of the one here, which is the successor of the one here. So to get to this entry in the composition table, you have gone from this and you've taken successor after successor after successor. In fact, you've taken successors b times to get to this entry in the composition table. But that, that successor rule never loops back round. It, you know, gets higher and higher. It always creates a new element of the natural numbers. So it's never going to be the case that this entry in the composition table is suddenly going to equal a. Um, it's always going to be some new natural number. It's never going to loop back around and suddenly equal a again. So that means that the only b that can go in here, such that a plus it will give back a, is going to be equal to 0. And that's how we can conclude that this is 0. And to get the other way around, that a times 0 is equal to 0, you just look at the other distributivity law, which I imagine is left distributivity, although don't quote those names. Um, so if we look at this distributivity law that says c times a plus b must equal c times a plus c times b. And by the way, we're going to prove in just a moment that these distributivity laws hold true for the entire composition table. Um, but at the moment, we're seeing how, if these are going to be true, it immediately gives us that we have to define these, this row and this column in this way. So once again, just let b equal 0, and you get that this is c times a plus 0. a plus 0 is a, so this is c times a, but then applying distributivity, it says that this is c times a plus c times 0, and then you've got that c times a is equal to c times a plus something, and again, through the exact same argument as we've had here, um, if you have that something is equal to something plus something, that and these two are the same, that has to be equal to the additive identity. So this is 0. So you've therefore got this both, way ra both ways round. Next, we know we want a multiplicative identity. We know what we're heading for. So we want 1 to be our multiplicative identity. So 1 times a is going to just give that a back again. And similarly, a times 1 is going to give a as well. So we can fill in these entries in the table as well. So 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 2 is 2, 1 times 3 is 3, 1 times 4 is 4, and similarly 2 times 1 is 2, 3 times 1 is 3, 4 times 1 is 4. So that's how we're going to define those entries. Next, let's move on to the actual interesting bit. So now how are we going to define the remaining rows? So starting with this row here. So the way we do it is again for a recursive relationship. So we're going to define this entry in terms of this entry. So this is how we're going to do it. So it's going to be that a times now the successor of b. So we're imagining this is our b, and now this is our successor of b. So this is a. So a times the successor of b is going to be in terms of a times b. So it's going to be a times b. And then what you need to do is add on an a. So we're going to define it in terms of addition, which we know we've already worked out and defined. And you can see how this makes sense, because remember, the successor of b is b plus 1. So a times b plus 1 needs to be the same as a times b, but then you need to add on a further a, because now you're multiplying by b plus 1. So if we do some examples to fill in our composition table, so 2 times 2 is going to be 2 times 1. So 2 times 2, a is 2 successor of b is 2, uh, so b is 1, so it will be 2 times 1 and then just plus 2, which is going to equal 4. Then 2 times 3 is going to be equal to 2 times 2 plus another 2, which is 6. 2 times 4 is 2 times 3 plus 2, 8. Then if we go down, so if we go to 3 now, 
So 3 times 2 is going to equal 3 times 1 plus this time 3. So it's going to be equal to 6. 3 times 3 is 3 times 2 plus a further 3, which is 9. 3 times 4 is 3 times 3 plus 3, 12. And we go on. So 4 times 2 will be 4 times 1 plus 4, 8. 4 times 3 is 4 times 2 plus 4, which is 12. 4 times 4 is 4 times 3 plus 4, which is 16. And there we have filled in our first 5 by 5 part of the great big multiplication composition table. So what we now want to do is prove distributivity, associativity, and commutativity of multiplication. And the order we're actually going to do it in is we'll do distributivity first, we'll then do commutativity, and then finally we'll do associativity. Distributivity is actually the easiest one to prove, and we're going to use distributivity in the proofs of the further two. Before we just move on to that, what I would like to point out is something that I probably actually should have pointed out for the addition composition table as well, and that's that this law that we used to define these rows onwards actually holds true even for the rows that were defined according to these rules up here. So if you like look at this row here, this still obeys this rule. So if you look at what 0 times 1 is equal to, it's actually equal to the one next to it, 0 times 0 plus 0. So it's obeying this rule, and indeed all of this row is obeying this rule. This rule for 1, again, it's obeying this rule. So if you look at, let's say, 1 times 3, you, it, again, you look at its neighbour to the left of it, 1 times 2, and take that and add on 1, you get 3. So it's obeying this rule. So all of the rows, even the ones that weren't defined according to this, they do actually obey this rule. And that is an important point because when we use induction, we're using that rule as though it obeys, as though the whole composition law composition table obeyed it and it does which is why it all worked but I didn't necessarily point that out for addition so this addition composition table even these lines which were defined first of all they still obey this property uh, and that is something that I probably should have pointed out when we were doing addition as well but I'm pointing it out now to you so let's begin by proving distributivity then so we'll go over here so we want to prove that for all a, b, and c are elements of the natural numbers, that a plus b times c is equal to a times c plus b times c. Now, really, we should be proving distributivity both ways round rather than just one way round. However, we will next prove commutativity. And if you have one of the distributivity laws and you have commutativity, then you instantly have the other one. So we'll just do distributivity one way around and then prove commutativity. So we want to prove this. So again, by for all introduction, we will assume A and B are elements of the natural numbers. And we then need to prove that for all C is an element of the natural numbers, that this holds true. And we're going to do this again by induction. So we'll prove that it's true in the case that C is equal to zero. And we'll then prove the induction bit, that if it's true for um, a general C, then it's true for the successor of C. And then from that, uh, we will, by the induction axiom, have that it's true for all C. And then by full introduction, we'll have that it's true for all A, B, and C. So let's first verify it for C is equal to 0 then, so the base case. So when C is equal to 0, uh, on this side we have A plus B, which is something, times 0. So the answer on that side is equal to 0. And then on this side, a times 0 is going to be equal to 0, and then b times 0 is going to equal 0. So we'll have 0 plus 0. So on that side, we also have 0. So yes, it's true for c is equal to 0. So we're now going to assume it's true for the general c, and we want to prove that it's then true for the successor of c. So we want to prove that a plus b times the successor of c is equal to a times the successor of c plus b times the successor of c. So let's start manipulating this side. So we'll use the definition of multiplication. So the definition of multiplication says that if you want to take x, and x is probably not a great choice now, let me just make it a curly x so that we can distinguish between it and the multiplication sign. So a curly x means 
an element of the natural numbers and straight x means multiplication. So x times, whoops, I almost went wrong there, times the successor of y is equal to x times y plus x. So we're going to plug this in as the successor of y. So c is now equal to y and x is equal to a plus b. So this turns this into a plus b, that's this bit here, times c plus and then a plus b, like so. And we could put a bracket here. So I hope that's clear. We've made y equal to c and we've made a plus b equal to x. So we've got x here, a plus b, c here, giving that, and then we've got plus another x. And that's just the recursive definition of multiplication because we're multiplying this by the successor of c. So we're writing that effectively in terms of what this multiplied by c is equal to. Um, so now, because we've assumed distributivity is true for c, we can apply it and we can change this into this. So this will become a times c plus b times c, all of that in brackets, plus a plus b. And now we're going to use some of the properties of addition that we know. So by the associativity and commutativity of addition, we can move this all around and we can write this like so. So we can write it as a times c plus a plus b times c plus b. So, you know, we're using associativity and commutativity of addition loads of times because we've just got this thing added to this thing, added to this thing, added to this thing. And because associativity and commutativity hold in addition, and we've proven that now, we know we can maneuver these around and maneuver the brackets around the addition however we like. So we've rewritten it like so, where we've got this thing plus this thing, and then we can put that in brackets and then plus this plus this. And why is that helpful to do? Because these things we can now apply this rule to. So they're these things on the left, and we want to get them back into this form. So a times c plus a is actually just a times the successor of c, and b times c plus b is actually just b times the successor of c by this definition. So let's write that down. So this is a times the successor of c. We'll put that in brackets, plus this is b times the successor of c. But look, that's exactly what we wanted to arrive at. So we've arrived at the thing that we wanted to show this is equal to. So we have proven that if this is true, then by the definition of multiplication, this is also true. So we've proven the inductive step. And as we've got that it's true for 0, by the induction axiom, we then have that it's true for all c as an element of the natural numbers. And as a and b were assumed to be general natural numbers, then by, again, repeated for all introduction, we have that for all a, b, and c are elements of the natural numbers, this holds true. So we have proven what I believe is right distributivity for the natural numbers. We're not going to bother proving the other way around, left distributivity. We're just going to prove commutativity, and then we'll have the other distributive law immediately. Let's prove commutativity next, and we're going to use the distributive law that we've just proven to prove commutativity. So... We want to prove then that for all a and b are elements of the natural numbers, that a times b is equal to b times a. So again, by for all introduction, we will assume that a is an element of the natural numbers, and then we'll just prove that for all b is an element of the natural numbers, that this is true, and we'll do that by induction. So we'll show that it's true when b is equal to 0, firstly. So this is trivial. So we've got a times 0 is equal to 0 times a. Both sides are 0. So yes, it's true when b is equal to 0. We'll assume it's true for the general b. And we now want to prove that it's true for the successor of b. So prove that a times the successor of b is equal to the successor of b times a. So again, we'll just apply the definition of multiplication of a successor to this side here. So I'll just write it down again. X, oh, 
and I'm writing addition, and I'm writing x's that can be confused with multiplication signs. So x times the successor of y, remember, is equal to x times y plus x. So applying that here, a is going to equal our x, b is going to equal our y. So we're going to get that this is a times b plus another a. What we can do is apply commutativity of a times b here. So that was what we assumed. We assumed it was true for b, and we're proving it's true for the successor of b. So we can write this as b times a plus a. Now we're going to try and use the distributive law that we've just proven. To do this, we need to also use the fact that 1 times a is equal to a. So we're going to replace the a here with 1 times a. So we're going to rewrite this as b times a plus 1 times a. And then by the distributivity law that we've just proven, we can rewrite this as b plus 1 times a. And then earlier on, we proved that b plus 1 is always equal to the successor of b. So we've got that this is equal to the successor of b times a, which is exactly what we wanted to show this was equal to. So we've shown that if it's true for b, we can then derive that it's true for the successor of b. And then by the induction axiom, we have that it's true for all b. And then by for all introduction, we have that it's true for all a and b are elements of the natural numbers. So we've proven commutativity. And now, commutativity with the right distributive law that we've got will then give us the left distributive law, if those are the correct names for it, but it will give us the other distributive law. I will just quickly demonstrate that, because we are going to use the other distributive law in our proof of associativity. So, we want to show that C times A plus B is equal to C times A plus c times b. Now we could do this by proof by induction, but we can do this simply with the results that we've already derived. So let's do this. So taking this side, by commutativity now, this is the same thing as a plus b times c. By the distributive law that we've already proven, this is a times c plus b times c. And then by commutativity, we can just rewrite both of these to c times a and this one to c times b. Oops. c times b. And therefore, we have our result. Finally, to complete the video then, let's prove associativity. So we want to prove for all a, b, and c are elements of the natural numbers that a times b times c is equal to a oops, times b times c. So again, by fraud introduction, repeat fraud introduction, it suffices to assume a and b are elements of the natural numbers and prove that for all c is an element of the natural numbers, this then holds true. And to prove that, we will use the induction axiom. So we need to prove that it's true for c is equal to zero, and then we need to prove that, given it true for some c, that it implies that it's then true for the successor of c. So firstly, c is equal to zero. Again, this is trivial. So on this side, this thing, you've got this times zero, which is zero. On this side, you've got b times zero, which is zero, and then a times that zero, which is also zero. So it's just zero is equal to zero, which is true. So now we'll assume that it's true for some general C. I'm losing the ability to write. Uh, now what we want to do is prove that it's true for the successor of C. So A times B times the successor of C is going to equal A times B times the successor of C. So we'll start with the left-hand side and derive the right-hand side. Again, we're just going to use the definition of the multiplication. I'm not going to write it down this time. Hopefully you all got familiar enough with it by now. So if we want to multiply this by the successor of this, we just multiply it by this and then add on an a times b. So it's going to be a times b times c. And then onto that, we're going to have to add an a times b. Then what we can do is we can apply 
um, associativity that we've assumed is true for um, C. We can apply that to this. So that will mean that this will become A times B times C plus A times B. And then what we'll do is we'll apply the distributive law that we've just proven to pull this A out the front. So we've got A times this plus A times this. So we can say that that is A times this plus this by that distributive law that we've proven. So this is going to be A times, and then inside the brackets we'll end up with B times C plus B. But this is excellent because B times C plus B is just B times the successor of B by the definition of multiplication. So this is equal to A times B times the successor of C, which is exactly what we wanted to show. We wanted to go from this thing to this thing, and through this manipulation here, we have been able to do that. We've shown now that if associativity is true for C, it's true for the successor of C, we know that it's true for zero, and therefore by the induction axiom we have that it's true for all C as an element of the natural numbers, and then by repeated broad introduction we have that associativity is true for all A, B and C are elements of the natural numbers. So with that a final flourish, we will end this video. What we have overall done then is we have proven that the addition and multiplication laws that we have defined on the natural numbers obey associativity and commutativity for addition and for multiplication obeys distributivity, commutativity and associativity and those are the major properties that we need it to obey in order to be able to do basic algebra on it and it makes the natural numbers a semi-ring.